power! Give me power! Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. A Turkish Airlines Boeing 737 is on final approach when it suddenly loses speed. Less than two kilometers remain to the runway, but the aircraft enters a stall. Will the pilots manage to save the situation? What's happening inside the cockpit? And why is a modern airliner in distress? Today, we will reconstruct the events and find out what really happened and how this incident changed the aviation industry forever. Atatürk Airport, Istanbul, Turkey, February 25, 2009. A passenger aircraft, a Boeing 737-800, operated by Turkish Airlines, is preparing for scheduled flight 1951 from Istanbul to Amsterdam. A total of 135 people board the aircraft, 128 passengers and seven crew members. In the cockpit, in the left seat, sits Captain Hassan Tasin Arasan, 54 years old. He is considered a highly experienced pilot within the airline, having nearly 13 years of service and over 17,000 total flight hours, 10,885 of which are on the Boeing 737. In the right seat is 42-year-old trainee first officer Murat Cesar. He has only 44 flight hours on the Boeing 737, and therefore the experienced Captain Arasan will be conducting his training through all stages of the flight. In the jump seat sits 28-year-old First Officer Alciaz Gur, whose task is to monitor the trainee's progress and assist the captain when needed. At 8.22 a.m. local time, the crew receives takeoff clearance from the tower, and the Boeing 737 lifts off from the runway of Atatürk Airport, heading toward Amsterdam. The flight from Istanbul to Amsterdam proceeds smoothly, without any irregularities. The aircraft follows its route over Eastern Europe, crosses Germany, and enters Dutch airspace. First Officer Zezer, as a trainee, is flying the aircraft under the supervision of Captain Arasan, a standard procedure in pilot training. At 10.05 a.m., the crew establishes radio contact with Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. They are instructed to prepare for landing on runway 18 right one of the airport's longest runways. The controller then gives them instructions to descend and maintain an altitude of 2,000 feet, about 610 meters, preparing for an ILS approach. ILS, the Instrument Landing System, is a radio navigation system that allows precise landings in low visibility conditions. It consists of two main components, the localizer, which indicates the direction of the runway, and the glide slope, which determines the proper angle of descent. The pilots, or the autopilot, follow the ILS signals displayed on their instruments, aligning the aircraft with the runway and descending smoothly. This system allows aircraft to land safely even in poor weather, providing both precision and reliability. The aircraft begins its descent, the pilots configure the autopilot for a dual-channel ILS approach, where both autopilot systems operate simultaneously for maximum accuracy. But already at the approach altitude of 2,000 feet, about 610 meters, an unexpected malfunction occurs. The left radio altimeter, the instrument that measures the aircraft's height above the ground using radio waves, suddenly begins showing incorrect data. Instead of 1,950 feet, it displays minus eight feet. This means the system believes that the aircraft is already on the ground. The right radio altimeter, however, continues to function correctly, showing the real altitude. In the cockpit, a warning tone sounds, an alert indicating low altitude. It's the landing gear warning, which usually activates when the aircraft is too low and the landing gear is not extended. But the pilots recognize it as a false alarm, since the gear is already down and the airplane is still about 600 meters above the ground. The critical error occurs in the auto throttle system, the automatic system that controls engine power. The left radio altimeter, showing negative eight feet, sends this false signal to the auto throttle, which then automatically enters 
retard mode, the idle thrust mode. Normally, this mode activates only during the final phase of landing, when the aircraft is just a few meters above the runway, reducing engine power to ensure a smooth touchdown. But now the aircraft is still at 600 meters, about 2,000 feet, and the engine thrust suddenly drops to idle. The situation is made worse by the fact that the pilots do not immediately notice the problem. The autopilot, which receives correct data from the right radio altimeter, tries to keep the aircraft on the glide path, raising the nose to compensate for the loss of speed. This increases the angle of attack, the angle between the wing and the oncoming airflow. The speed of the aircraft drops from 144 knots, 267 kilometers per hour, to dangerously low levels. The trainee pilot is still the one flying the aircraft. At 10.26 a.m., the airspeed falls to a critical 110 knots, below the safe threshold. In the cockpit, the stall warning sounds and the control column shaker activates. All signs indicate that the aircraft is about to lose lift. Captain Arasan immediately takes control and shouts, Power! Give me power! The pilots push the throttles forward, trying to increase engine power. But the engines, which had been at idle, cannot accelerate fast enough in such a short time. The aircraft enters a stall, a condition in which the wings lose lift due to an excessive angle of attack. The nose drops and the airplane plunges rapidly toward the ground. Seconds later, the Boeing 737 crashes into a field about 1.5 kilometers, 0.9 miles, short of runway 18 right. The impact occurs at a speed of approximately 175 kilometers per hour, 109 miles per hour. The fuselage breaks into three sections, and one of the engines tears away from the wing. Fortunately, the fuel does not ignite, preventing a post-crash fire. The crash site, a field in the polder area not far from the highway, looks horrific. Wreckage is scattered across hundreds of meters. The first rescue teams arrive within minutes. Of the 135 people on board, nine die instantly. All three pilots, one flight attendant, and five passengers. 84 people are injured, some of them seriously. Survivors describe the sudden drop and the massive impact but many remained calm, helping one another escape the wreckage. Chiphole Airport temporarily suspends operations to investigate the cause of the disaster. Soon after, investigators from the Dutch Safety Board arrive at the scene, together with specialists from the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, since the aircraft was American-built. The commission now faces a difficult question. Why did a modern jetliner crash on approach just a few kilometers short of the runway? Was it pilot error or a mechanical defect? The investigation begins immediately. Investigators recover the black boxes, devices that record both the aircraft's system data and cockpit conversations. Analysis reveals that the failure of the left radio altimeter played a key role in the crash. The radio altimeter had been transmitting incorrect data, minus eight feet, and this false reading was used by the auto throttle system. As a result, the auto throttle reduced engine thrust, leading to a loss of airspeed. But why didn't the pilots notice the problem? The investigation identified several contributing factors. The first, the human factor. The pilots were occupied with approach preparations and may have ignored the repeated low altitude warnings, assuming they were false alarms. Captain Arasan, as an instructor, may have been distracted by monitoring the trainee pilot, Cesar. In addition, the crew failed to monitor the airspeed, a key flight parameter that must always be controlled, even when the autopilot is engaged. The second factor was the technical failure. The left radio altimeter did not register its own malfunction, so the aircraft systems interpreted its incorrect readings as valid. The investigation revealed that similar radio altimeter failures had occurred on the same aircraft twice in the previous eight landings. In those cases, the flight crews managed to correct the problem manually, 
by disconnecting the auto throttle and increasing engine thrust themselves. So why wasn't the problem corrected this time? Investigators found that Turkish Airlines had not removed the radio altimeter for maintenance, and Boeing had not provided clear operational guidance on how to respond to such failures. The third factor was a design flaw. The Boeing 737-800's auto throttle system relied on data from only one radio altimeter without any redundancy. If the system had compared the readings of the left and right altimeters, the error could have been detected. Moreover, the pilot manuals contained no procedures for dealing with a radio altimeter malfunction during flight. The investigation also revealed that Boeing and U.S. regulators, including the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, had pressured Dutch authorities to soften the criticism directed at the manufacturer. In 2020, the New York Times reported that the initial draft of the Dutch Safety Board, DSB, report contained much stronger conclusions about Boeing's design flaws, but those findings were toned down after intervention from the American side. Professor Sidney Decker, whose independent research had been commissioned by the DSB, accused Boeing of trying to shift the blame onto the pilots in order to divert attention from the aircraft's technical issues. After the crash, Boeing issued a service bulletin reminding pilots of the importance of monitoring airspeed and altitude and advising crews to avoid using the auto throttle and autopilot if the radio altimeter malfunctioned. Turkish Airlines strengthened its pilot training programs and conducted inspections of radio altimeters across its Boeing 737 fleet. The crash of Flight 1951 became a turning point for the global aviation industry, a reminder that even a small sensor error can bring down a modern aircraft, and that technology, no matter how advanced, cannot replace human vigilance. It highlighted the danger of over-reliance on automation and the importance of redundancy in critical systems. In the aftermath, Boeing revised its procedures for radio altimeter testing, and airlines around the world enhanced crew training to better prepare pilots for non-standard and emergency situations. This tragedy also raised a crucial question, the balance between automation and the human factor. Modern aircraft are equipped with complex systems that greatly assist pilots, but at the same time can create a false sense of security. Pilots must always be ready to take manual control at any moment, especially when the automation fails. The crash of Turkish Airlines Flight 1951 is not merely a story about a faulty radio altimeter or pilot error. It is a reminder that aviation safety depends on many factors. The reliability of technology, the quality of crew training, the transparency of manufacturers, and the strict oversight of regulators. Nine lives were lost, but the lessons learned from this tragedy have likely saved thousands more. Today, flights continue to and from Schiphol Airport, and the Boeing 737 remains one of the most popular aircraft in the world. But the story of Flight 1951 will forever remain in aviation history, a reminder that even a small mistake can lead to a catastrophe. In aviation, every flight begins with trust in people, in technology, and in experience. And sometimes, that trust is tested in the sky.